Welcome. My name is Scott Eisner. I'm the Senior Vice President of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and President of the U.S. Africa Business Center. As many of you may know, the Chamber is home to millions of companies and is nearly 110 years old. Today's forum uh, is one that we're pleased to partner as an official uh, partnering organization uh, for the private sector component of the virtual AGOA trade ministerial taking place over October 20 and 21. They'll be hosted by the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative and many offices across the U.S. government. While we wish circumstances were different, and we're hosting this dialogue in person, the fact that we can convene virtually during the devastating global pandemic allows us to maintain focus on important commercial engagement between the United States and Africa. In fact, it's fairly seamless transition to the digital uh, that is precisely what we like to focus on today. Technology has changed our lives at an incredible speed since the AGO legislation was passed in 2000. With the expansion of digital connectivity, e-commerce, mobile payments, adoption of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and cloud computing. Since the WHO declared the coronavirus a global pandemic in March 2020, this pace of change has been rapidly accelerated, highlighting the need to harness the digital economy as a driver for growth and innovation across a variety of sectors and industries. This transformation will have implications for the global economy, trade among African countries across the continent, and the continent's commercial partnership with the United States. This is the reason that the U.S. Africa Business Center will be convening an Africa Digital Economy Summit this December to build on successful, successful market-specific dialogues we've convened to focus on digital transformation in Nigeria, South Africa, and Kenya in prior years. This shift to a continental focus for our Digital Economy Summit also takes into account the next steps for the implement, implementation of the African Continental Free Ter Trade Area which initiated trading in June as African leaders prepared to undertake negotiations on e-commerce and other critical service trade issues in upcoming talks. It also aligns with our engagement with the AFCFTA Secretariat and our advocacy to the Biden administration. Positive steps certainly have been taken to engage the continent, including President Biden's remarks at the African Union Summit in February, the impact that several senior administration officials have made while traveling to the continent in the past number of months, and this past week's meeting between President Biden and President Kenya, Kenyatta of Kenya. The conversations are only in the beginning. If the United States is going to be serious about being the partner of choice on the continent and serious about competing with the likes of EU, China, Japan, and others, we need to take bold and concrete steps to ensure that American companies are aware of the opportunity to invest in and partner with African businesses. The U.S. Africa Business Center outlined a series of recommendations from the U.S. business community that highlighted five distinct ways in which President Biden and his administration can take concrete steps to renew America's relationship with African continent and therefore support enhanced economic partnerships throughout his administration's policy engagement. Our center outlined a series of recommendations, as I mentioned, that will drive this agenda forward. They are make Africa engagement a presidential priority. Unless the President of the United States deems it to be a priority, we know that we're, path, we're going along the same path as we always have. We need to include those engagements as an Africa Leaders Summit, similarly as we saw years prior, and business forums as soon as feasibly possible. We don't have enough time to wait. We need to create coherence on U.S.-Africa trade, including the continued negotiations on the Kenya FTA. And of course, we'll be hearing from Cabinet Secretary Betty Minan later in the program, while we pursue a more modern, comprehensive approach to trade with the African continent including capacity building to support the trade agenda in the African continental free trade area. And today we'll hear more about that as well. We need to deepen and expand progress on the whole of government approach to enhance competitiveness for U.S. businesses on the continent, including a focus on trade facilitation, science-based regulatory cooperation, and intellectual property enforcement. We need to enhance the role of U.S. funded capacity building to strengthen the position of U.S. interest at multilateral forum on the continent, and importantly for today's conversation, we need to engage, on, engage African governments on policy and regulatory best practices that support the growth of the digital economy and digital trade. In fact, we've called for a U.S.-Africa Digital Economy Summit that we hope the administration will pursue. We hope today's AGOA forum and the ministerial meeting over the next few days will begin to lay the groundwork for the administration to act on the business community's recommendations and support for a more robust relationship with the continent. From the passage of the landmark legis legislation more than 20 years ago to our forum today, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has been supportive of the U.S. of the uh, Africa Growth and Opportunity Act and what it represents, a vehicle to spur U.S.-Africa commercial relationship through trade and investment. This forum is entitled Leveraging New Pathways to Trade, Enabling the Digital Economy, because we believe it represents the next chapter, the ability to strategically build on the growing trade partnerships in emerging areas of trade 
will set a course for the future of the U.S. commercial relationship with the continent. And to help inaugurate this conversation, I'm pleased to recognize and welcome to the conversation today, Diane Farrell, Acting Undersecretary for International Trade at the U.S. Department of Commerce. She's an old friend of the Chambers, but more importantly, she's a strong advocate for what the business community can do abroad. She'll provide some welcome remarks and perhaps uh, address some of the uh, conversation points I addressed just a minute ago. Under Secretary Farrell, we invite you to, to bring greetings from the Department of Commerce and our government partners. Thank you. Well, thank you, Scott, for your introduction. And thanks to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, U.S. Africa Business Center for hosting this event today. And a special thank you to our distinguished speakers. The topic of today's panel, Leveraging New Pathways, Enabling the Digital Economy, has never been more relevant than it is today. COVID-19 has further accelerated the ongoing digital evolution in the United States, in countries across Africa and around the world. The fact that we are holding this event virtually, as is the AGOA Ministerial, highlights this reality quite clearly. The digital economy is one of our key priority sectors around the world, especially in Africa, for the Biden-Harris administration and for the Department of Commerce as well. We are devoting resources toward better understanding how the sector is evolving and how we collaborate with like-minded partners from the United States and abroad to positively impact this process of change. Ultimately, we aspire to an open, interoperable, reliable and secure digital ecosystem that can serve as a driver of growth in the United States and across the African continent. And we hope to be trusted advisors and partners. The digital economy is a broad term and it means many different things to many different people. It certainly includes digital infrastructure, such as mobile operating net operator networks and fiber optic cables. There are areas where we have seen significant movement, including Google's announcement earlier this month of plans to invest $1 billion over five years in African digital connectivity and startups. We also saw an agreement earlier this year between Africel and the government of Angola for the former to build out the country's newest mobile network. This effort was supported by the U.S. government in Washington and at the embassy in Luanda through the Department of Commerce's advocacy process, which assists U.S. companies competing for foreign government contracts. The success highlights the critical work that we do to encourage the use of trusted vendors and support mutually beneficial commercial partnerships in the African digital ecosystem. The digital economy also refers to innovations in digital startups and fintech, such as mobile money, an innovation that was pioneered on the African continent through the likes of M-Pesa. At its broadest sense, digital economy refers to every sector impacted by digital technologies and services, which includes almost all aspects of our economies. We are also in a period of significant change as it relates to the nature of US Africa and intra-Africa trade and investment we witnessed the beginning of phase one trade under the African Continental Free Trade Area or AFCFTA in January of 2021. And that is being implemented, and as that is being implemented, the African Union Commission, its member states, and the AFCFTA Secretariat are working to negotiate an e-commerce chapter. Additionally, as we approach 2025, when the current AGOA authorization expires, there is significant discussion over how the U.S.-Africa trade relationship can adapt and build upon AGOA. The importance of the digital economy is clearer than ever, and its nexus with AGOA, the AFCFTA, and other developments present many questions as to how it can and should evolve, and the roles for private and public actors in its evolution. I am particularly excited to hear the thoughts of the distinguished speakers during this event, who are themselves thought leaders and expert practitioners in this space. Thank you again for the invitation to speak today. I greatly look forward to the upcoming conversation. Well, many thanks, Diane. It's like always great to have your support and your engagement. We're going to now shift the conversation a little bit. Uh, I believe that we're going to be having uh, Minister Isa Ali Ibrahim Tami join us in just a moment, although there may be some changes in that lineup due to some travel uh, challenges on the continent, which I'm sure we can all appreciate and really long for uh, into the future when we can travel uh, more broadly again. But I do want to highlight a December 2020 Wall Street Journal article that forecasts that by 2024, e-commerce could represent as much as a quarter of all global retail. 
by any measure that represents a significant disruptor for economic activity around the world and a key driver for the digital age. Earlier this year, Visa published a study on e-commerce in Sub-Saharan Africa that showed e-commerce growth could grow by, or did grow by a dizzying 42% year, year over year from 2019 to 20. The report also suggests the reason is poised to outgrow other regions driven by the strength of South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, as the region's market leaders in e-commerce. I'm now pleased uh, to recognize what I believe is uh, uh, Dr. Femi Adule, uh, who will be representing the government of Nigeria and the Ministry of Communications and Digital Economy on behalf of the minister, who unfortunately at the last minute was forced to travel. So I will now turn over the platform to you, Doctor. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I bring you warm greetings from the minister. Um, who unfortunately can't be here because of a trip, like um, Scott just said. He really wanted to participate, but um, he sends his apologies and asked me to stand in for him. Um, so I'll just go ahead to read his speech and then um, I'll take whatever comments you have back to the minister. So I, I extend greetings to Scott Eisner, the president, US Africa Business Center and US Chamber of Commerce and Honorable Diane Farrell, Acting um, Undersecretary of Commerce for International Trade of the United States. Honorable Betty Miner, the Cabinet Secretary of the Ministry of Industrialization, Tra Trade and Enterprise Development of Kenya. Kendra Gaitner, um, Vice President, US Africa Business Center. Dr. Uzodima Iwela and um, his Excellency Wamkele Mene. I'm very delighted to give this keynote address at the US Chamber of Commerce's Virtual Private Sector African Growth and Opportunity Act Agua Forum. I wish to thank Scott Eisner, the President, US Africa Business Center, and Senior Vice President, US Chamber of Commerce, as well as the US Chamber of Commerce team for this invitation. Your theme are leveraging new pathways to trade, enabling the digital economy could not have come at a better time. As the digital economy is now playing a far more defining role than it did over 24 years ago when the African Growth and Opportunity Act was enacted. For instance, according to UNCTAD, while global trade in goods and services reduced between 2019 and 2020, um, e-commerce's share in global retail increased within the same period. And this shows the growing importance of e-commerce to global trade. Furthermore, the adoption of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement has also changed the dynamics of trade within the continent. As the digital economy champion for AFC uh, FTA in Nigeria, I'm coordinating efforts to ensure that digital services and tools serve as the main driver for the agreement. In Nigeria, we've experienced the impact of the digital economy. For example, the ICT sector played an important role in enabling us to exit recession in the fourth quarter of 2020, as the sector was the fastest growing sector with the growth rate of 14.70% in that quarter. The sector also contributed 17.98% to the gross domestic product of Nigeria in the second quarter of 2021. This has been its highest ever contribution. We have taken a lot of steps towards creating an enabling environment for e-commerce in Nigeria. For the purpose of today's events and due to time constraints, I will touch on a few, and these are, first one is creating the right policy environment Second is ensuring the protection and privacy of data. The third is supporting the promotion of digital skills. The fourth is enabling payment solutions that are digital and innovative. And finally, the last number five is encouraging partnership. Concerning the policy environment, on adoption, on assumption of office as Minister of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, there was no ministry that was assigned the responsibility of developing our country's digital economy. As such, we wrote to the president and requested for this mandate and for the name of the ministry to be changed to the Ministry of 
and digital economy in line with global best practice. This request was approved and subsequently we developed the 2020 to 2030 National Digital Economy Policy and Strategy NDEPS for a Digital Nigeria. This policy is based on eight pillars that address all the areas required for the sustainable growth of the digital economy. The NDEPS document also served as a basis for all the other regulatory instruments used to support the digital economy and by extension, e-commerce. We have developed 16 of such policies. For example, we developed the Nigeria National Broadband Plan 2020-2025 to provide the broadband infrastructure required to support e-commerce. The National Policy for Virtual Engagements in the Federal Public Service was also developed to institutionalize virtual engagements in the public sector. The National Digital Innovation Entrepreneurship and Startup Policy has also been developed to create the right enabling environment for startups and innovation-driven enterprises. Data protection and privacy. As digital platforms become more prevalent and with the increasing vitrification of society, data is now playing a very important role in all we do, including how we trade online. To promote the safe use of e-commerce and digital technologies, we have accelerated the provision of digital identity to Nigerians and legal residents. I've also paid extra attention to cybersecurity, data protection, and data privacy. We are now approaching 64 million unique enrollments for the national identification numbers names. This translates into an additional 21 million names in just over a year since the um, National Identity Management Commission, NMC, was put under our supervision. We have also developed the Nigerian Data Protection Regulation and ensuring compliance. In addition to this, we have reached an advanced stage in the development of a principal legislation for data protection and privacy. Digital skills. We recognize the importance of digital skills to the success of the digital economy, and we're constantly providing physical and virtual trainings to Nigerians. During the COVID-19 lockdown period in 2020, we created two online academies, and these platforms have been used to train over 215,000 trainees, mainly in advanced digital technologies such as blockchain, data analytics, and other emerging technologies. A digitally skilled society is more likely to adopt the use of e-commerce platforms for trading. And we're also having a program with Microsoft that is going to train 5 million people over the next couple of years. Digital payments. E-commerce depends on digital payments to a large extent. While some e-payment platforms allow their customers to use cash for payment upon receipt of their goods, the preference is clearly digital payments. As a ministry, we have supported digital payments in a number of ways. For example, most payments utilize either utilize mobile applications on structured supplementary service data, USSD. All these ride on telecommunication networks, so there needs to be a synergy between the banks and the mobile network operators. We encourage this synergy and have also stepped in when there has been some friction between both parties. Also, as part of the implementation of the broadband plan, we're supporting activities that will reduce the average cost of data and the cost of mobile devices. We are also on committees with relevant public institutions such as the Central Bank of Nigeria and submit our input and comments from time to time for policies that can affect the growth of Nigeria's digital economy. Lastly, encouraging partnerships. The development of Nigeria's digital economy requires strategic partnerships. Since I became minister, the minister responsible for the sector, I have promoted partnerships between the parastatals under my supervision with other relevant agencies, the private sector, developmental agencies, non-governmental organizations, and international organizations like US Chamber of Commerce, among others. The partnership with the digital last mile logistic providers has greatly supported e-commerce in Nigeria through the delivery of products to customers. We always seek to create a win-win scenario for all parties concerned I will look forward to greater partnerships in the future. In conclusion, I would like to say that we look forward to partnering with the Chambers Agoa Forum 
with respect to our digital economy. Once again, I thank you for the invitation and kind attention. I also wish you a very successful forum. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Femi, for giving us that great case study of what Nigeria has done uh, to create the enabling environment that we're going to delve a little deeper into during this afternoon's panel. Um, it really is an opportunity to connect uh, the, the statistics and the data that uh, Scott Eisner shared uh, and the case study uh, that uh, Dr. Femi shared to be able to dive deeper into this uh, subject and how uh, e-commerce can be an accelerator, not just for growth, but how we can expand cross-border trade and trade through AGOA. So with that to help us uh, to dive into the subject, I'm pleased to uh, welcome three distinguished panelists who will help illuminate the, the issues of digital payment, skills, costs of, of services and devices, safety, all the things that Dr. Femi put on the table. Pleased to be joined by uh, Kuseni Dlamini, who is the chairman of MassMart, Bohani Lungwane, who is the managing director and group head of sales, trade, and working capital for APSA Group, and Matt Davies, who's the vice president for sales for the Middle East, Indian subcontinent, and Africa for FedEx Express. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for this discussion. And I wanna jump right in so we can uh, hear from you. I'd like to, to start with a question for all of you uh, to sort of set the scene. Um, you heard the comments from, from Dr. Femi and the, the dizzying growth numbers that Scott shared. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, how you see um, the opportunities for e-commerce and promoting intra-African trade. I'm going to start with you first, Kuseni, and then uh, we'll go to Matt and Bohani. Kuseni, I'm afraid that we're not hearing you. Now we know it's a virtual forum if there's a tech challenge. Do you want to try again? Good morning to colleagues in the U.S. and in the Northern Hemisphere, and good afternoon to colleagues in the Southern Hemisphere in Africa. It's a great pleasure and, and, and privilege to be part of this session. I represent MassMart as the chairman of the board of MassMart. We operate across 13 sub-Saharan countries. We've got 400 uh, in 11 stores, and we employ over 40,000 associates across Africa. We really see the digitalization opportunity as um, a, a golden moment for us to serve our customers better and to also improve in terms of convenience and efficiency. And, and Africa is uh, digitalizing at a very fast pace. And I had the acting under secretary of state in her opening remarks also highlighting the, the trend towards digitalization in Africa. We're seeing it on the ground uh, as, as retailers. Uh, last year, for example, we saw about 90% increase in our e-commerce sales uh, during 2020, which was um, marked by the lockdowns that we were living through. And we see dig digitalization as a unique opportunity for us as traditional retailers to be able to uh, expand our businesses and even offer goods that may not necessarily be on our, sh on our sh shelves. By adopting digital tools, we, I believe that traditional retailers can leverage their network of customers and suppliers. And uh, we also see that as an opportunity for, for us to uh, extend the offering that, that we provide. So it's something that we also see as an important underpin as we talk about the African continental free trade area. We talk about AGOA and uh, increasing trade between the USA and, and, and Africa. And I think this conversation provides us with that opportunity to look at how do we operationalize the opportunities? How do we unlock the benefits that are there? Because there are immense benefits. And I believe that digitalization certainly is a new pathway that will help Africa trade its way out of poverty, out of underdevelopment, and modernize its, its economies. Much of retail across Africa is largely informal. We don't see that as a problem as mass We see it as an opportunity for us to be a catalyst 
in the modernization and formalization of retail and by so doing contribute to making sure that you've got resilient supply chains, resilient local economies that employ locals. In all the countries where we operate in Africa, we seek to source goods and services from local suppliers. More than 95% of the associates that we employ in every African country are locals. We spend resources and time in training talent so that we've got talent that is local, but also part of a global business such as MassMart. We are very pleased to be part of the Walmart family. And across the world, we see customers embracing uh, e-commerce and being part of Walmart, we are able to learn best practices from different parts of the world and bring them to Africa and assist in improving our offering here. I'll pause for now there. Thank you. No, thank you, Kaseni. You gave us a lot to, to work with. And I think it's a great segue to Matt because you talked about engaging local um, uh, companies and SMEs. So Matt, can you tell us sort of about the opportunities that you will see for intra-African trade through e-commerce? Well, yeah, look, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to join this esteemed panel. And um, you know, representing FedEx is, is, is a wonderful opportunity for me because you know, e-commerce is really at the heart of FedEx's strategy and its future. And particularly, you know, living here in the in what we call the Mesa region, which is Middle East, India and uh, sub and, and Africa. It's just amazing. And Africa in particular is one of those uh, the, the sort of last bastions of business um, and opportunity um, in the FedEx world that we're really looking to take uh, opportunities over the coming uh, over the coming years. But clearly, e-commerce has brought a sea change in the profile of global trade. And that's been exacerbated, of course, by uh, the pandemic. And it's created a whole series of opportunities as well as issues for governments and companies. But the point of e-commerce really provides opportunities, particularly in the micro, small and medium-sized enterprises. And that's where the opportunity for FedEx really comes a lot. And although we're a very, very large company, a large proportion of our business does come from that segment. And e-commerce is really opening up opportunities that may not have happened previously in the past, and particularly on the continent of Africa. So the delivery market in the e-commerce is really marked by a high level of competition and incentivize market players to innovate and become different and separate from the competition. And that's something that FedEx have done really well. One of the things, the opportunity for us with e-commerce has been in for our team members and operations, um, including things like um, computer assisted vehicles, artificial intelligence, robotics and drones. And that's going to be the new way of delivering e-commerce as, as time goes by. You know, just as an example, uh, Kendra, we talk about what we've done in Johannesburg and we actually have just completed our first uh, trial of our electric delivery, delivery vehicle in Johannesburg and the result was extremely positive. So at the moment, we're now finalising plans to introduce permanent electrical vehicles in our fleets in Johannesburg, which of course will likely lead on to other parts of Africa as well. So we really see that uh, our innovation and the way and the customer that we're dealing with is really the great opportunities for, for growth. And innovation, new opportunities are going to be the heart of it, are really the heart of what Africa's future is when it comes to global trade. Thank you for that. That, that was a great uh, touch point on all the different parts of the ecosystem that we'll get into in a minute in terms of the different technical um, enabling opportunities. But I want to first turn to Bohani to talk about uh, the opportunities that um, the APSA group and the, the financial services sector are seeing for intra-African trade uh, through e-commerce. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be with the esteemed panel today in this forum. Um, I am um, Managing Director and Head of Sales for Trade and Working Capital at APSA Group. Uh, we are present in 12 markets in the continent. We are a leading Pan-African financial organization that is focused at making sure that we can help the continent and the countries, um, you know, uh, trade with uh, other regions, but also drive inter-regional trade within Africa. Uh, so we are really at the call phase of driving trade and myself as somebody that has been uh, in trade finance for a long time, um, we are interacting with our customers as they start to think or as they are engaging with e-commerce. 
I suppose um, from, you know, I just want to take it back a little bit in, in, in terms of saying, if you imagine a trader that is in Mozambique, in the southern part of the continent, who whose access to customers could have simply just been walking customers um, that walk into their stall. The advent of e-commerce and what e-commerce means is that it starts to give them an opportunity for a bigger market because all of a sudden it creates a platform through which suppliers and buyers can actually uh, meet without necessarily having to physically uh, you know, uh, move. And I think it's a very important um, aspect of what e-commerce means for intra-Africa trade. I, and I suppose um, the fact that it coincides with uh, you know, the restricted travels as a result of COVID, it more than any other time has become very much important for African traders and all the people that are actually trading within the continent. So for, for a start, I think the whole aspect of e-commerce, uh, it's really about making sure that you can access suppliers, access buyers, bigger markets than you ordinarily would have been able to, and making sure that you can connect with buyers and suppliers across the continent, and in the process, removing the multiple ineff inefficiencies that you know uh, ordinarily exist um, in the marketplace um, and and making sure that you are in you can then access um, you know all kinds of uh, products and services without having to travel and we as APSA group um, have been engaged in this either you know in facilitating cross-border payments um, you know or whether it is assisting our customers in um, East Africa through the mobile uh, money platforms, but more recently as well through the creation of uh, bank agnostic uh, marketplaces, and we're working on on stuff like that even in our markets in, in, in markets like Ghana to make sure that our customers can access um, you know a wide range of suppliers and a wide range of of buyers without having to move. It's a very important aspect. I think the kind of growth that uh, you know, gets opened up for uh, you know our customers. It's it's actually exponential. So it's a very important aspect, and there's a lot of engagement that we are seeing. And I think if you if you look at also um, what this means from an intra Africa trade perspective in the context of the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement is that we would need to make sure that the market is accessible, not just to the big, you know, local, large, 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 large local corporates or multinationals, but it's access, accessible to SMEs as well, where as banks, we, we know that that's where the biggest uh, deficit in terms of trade finance exists. So I think critical and most importantly, as far as we're concerned, e-commerce is about opening up the markets giving suppliers bigger markets, big, giving buyers uh, bigger access to products within the continent, which makes sure you know, that it also gives an incentive in terms of suppliers uh, to actually you know, start to create even more products beyond their own jurisdictions or beyond their own markets. So in a sense, as far as we're concerned, this is about bigger markets, bigger opportunities, as well as making sure that we can facilitate um, you know, this this movement of goods with ease, with more ease than previously we've been doing. Thank you very much. No, thank you for that, Bahani. And I'm going to stay with you for a moment because you really made a great case for what the opportunity is. And I, I heard from all of you some aspect of how uh, we connect SMEs to this opportunity to make market bigger. So we've identified what the opportunity is. So let's talk about the enabling environment. And I want to, again, start with you, Bahani, first uh, to just uh, boomerang back to that, that question of the enabling environment. How do we connect opportunity with implementation? And really, how does that uh, enabling environment allow for that greater uh, digitization and commerce, not just in the AFCFTA that you pointed to, but in allowing that bigger access to the United States through, through the AGOA? So why don't you kick us off, Bahani, then we'll go to Ksenia and then Matt this time. Thank you very much, Kendra. There, there are a number of, I suppose, factors that are quite important to make sure that we can create an enabling environment as far as digitization and e-commerce are concerned. 
The first one, I think, it's the regulatory framework. It's ensuring that we can create a standardized regulatory framework that ensures that whether I am, you know, part of a marketplace in South Africa, in Zambia, or in Kenya, or anywhere in the continent, uh, the standards are still the, are the same in terms of the regulatory framework. And I think one of the most important things, therefore, in this regard, it's, it's how the Continental Free Trade Agreement is aimed at standardizing the regulatory framework. As we know, uh, e-commerce, um, it's phase two of the Continental Free Trade Area. It's important that the protocol for standardized um, uh, regulatory framework is created. The second aspect, and I think um, you know, the, somebody touched on this, it's ensuring that uh, the digital infrastructure is in place to enable, um, uh, I suppose, stability, reliability, and trust. Because if I'm going to get into, for example, a marketplace digitally, I need to make sure that it's a stable marketplace. I can make an order when I'm supposed to make an order, and the other party can get the order when they're supposed to get the order. They can ship when they're supposed to ship, and I can get paid when I'm supposed to get paid. We also think that it's important to gather with the you know this 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 regulatory or standardization of regulatory framework it's as, it's also important that there's simplification of you know the standard as well to make sure that um it's not something that is complicated somebody said to me that when you talk about a digital framework or a digital platform or e-commerce you must make sure that a trader does not find the experience much more complex than what they were used to. Otherwise, there is just no incentive for them to be able to, to get involved in such. I think the other issue that we need to solve to make sure that it's an enabling environment, it's, and I, I know the minister, uh, spokesperson touched on this on behalf of the minister, making sure that we, we, we deal issues of data privacy as well as, uh, sorry, data protection as well as cyber security. I think I want to put it this way, that, you know, if I'm a trader and I'm sitting at the corner of uh, whatever street in South Africa or anywhere else in the world, in, in, in Africa, in Zambia or, or in Kenya, when somebody walks past and they spot a service or a good that they're interested in, they give me physical cash and I exchange the cash for the goods. I get instantaneous value at exactly the time I exchange the value. Now, it's important that um, you know the digital platforms and the marketplaces that are digital make sure that I, I can actually access uh, payments instantaneously. So one of the enabling uh, uh, factors for me would be creating a situation or a scenario where traders are able to access their cash when they're supposed to access cash. So in my view, if we're able to sort out these issues, then I think we create an enabling environment that ensures digitization and e-commerce. And in closure, let me say, I think it's it's quite encouraging that as part of the Continental Free Trade Agreement, a whole lot of these things that I've, you know, we've been speaking about or that I've addressed are actually in, you know, encapsulated and are captured as part of the free trade area. And it will be interesting to see how that progress and implementation uh, accelerates because it's critical for us to, to, to make sure that uh, uh, digitization and e-commerce are enabled within the continent. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. I'm going to turn now to Kuseni to, to tell us uh, where he sees that enabling environment um, uh, where we can sort of, you know, pull out those key ingredients for the AFCFTA and AGOA. And Kuseni, we're, we're going to ask you to... Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to contribute to this very important question. I think the enabling environments in Agoa and the African continental free trade area are very crucial um, pieces of the puzzle that are going to help Africa to leverage the potential from its free trade area. I, I also acknowledge that the African Opportunity and Growth Act has been a cornerstone of UK, US economic policy. Although Agoa has facilitated the trade relationship and uh, helped businesses and consumers in the United States and on the continent, e-commerce and other digital advances are going to change the landscape. And that is why we have to talk about the enabling environment. In my mind, there are four critical considerations 
in talking about the enabling environment, Kindra, which you have rightly raised. The first one is the issue of clarity and interoperability of trade rules. Supply chains are now more complex than, than ever before. They are, they are incorporating a variety of fulfillment models. We're seeing faster transactions. We're seeing new sellers enter, entering the fray, shippers and impo importers interacting with each other. It is therefore very important to have very clear and consistent rules on how governments approach these new models and ensure a level playing field in order to reduce risk in whatever process is, is underway, especially at the border. Where possible, cross-border standardization among governments is, needs to be attended to because it can assist in giving businesses more certainty to expand and grow their footprints. The second part uh, or point that I want to highlight is that digital needs physical infrastructure. Why do we tend to talk about e-commerce in the purely digital sense? Behind the scenes, it has to be underpinned by hard and efficient infrastructure, which is critical, if not indispensable to its success. Supply chain optimization remains a very significant challenge across many parts of Africa. Much of the urban growth that we see across the continent is largely informal and uncontrolled, which then puts considerable strain on delivering products and services with underdeveloped infrastructure. Logistics facilitation from port of entry to last mile distribution is therefore very much part of the equation. And I dare say it can make or break an e-commerce strategy regardless of how great the product is. So in a nutshell, we have to go back to the basics and get our infrastructure right, especially the physical infrastructure. Of course, I cannot underplay the importance of the social infrastructure in investing in human capital and healthcare across the continent. And thirdly, the digitalization of government services is often under-indexed in discussions such as the one we are having today. When governments endorse the development of digital tools and support their deployment in key systems such as tax, customs, licensing and permitting and public procurement, they can enhance efficiency of public administration. Digital transparency can also raise compliance standards and increase trust between small and medium enterprises, for example, and global firms, and thus facilitating the integration of more communities in the global supply chains of our times. And then the last point that, that I think is equally important is that of seller support. For many small and local businesses, selling products internationally or through e-commerce distribution models can look very different from their local operations. In addition, regulatory systems and compliance is often a key challenge. We therefore need to consider briefings that are targeted to small businesses on trading compliance requirements under AGOA or the African Continental Free Trade Area. I mean, for example, a specific area that's relevant to us as a retailer is that of food safety training for small and medium enterprises that want to be part and parcel of our supply chain. And if they don't meet our standards, we don't just chase them away. We say, how can we help you? You've set out an industrial engineering capability within our business uh, with the colleagues that are there to handhold suppliers that struggle to meet our standards so that they can be able to, to comply. So there's a lot that can be done to really enable small and medium enterprises and large enterprises to to operationalize and actually take advantage of the African continental free trade area and also take advantage of the uh, Africa Growth and Opportunity Act opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Kuseni. I have a feeling that Matt would agree with quite a lot of the, what you put on the table. So let's turn to him and hear those key ingredients that he would identify for the enabling environment. Yeah, I, I think, uh, Cassini probably read some of my speaking notes because he's he's really hit the nail on the head in some key areas, and um, but I'd love to sort of expand on that. I think there's one thing that resonated with me that Cassini said, which is it really is about getting the basics right. So from a FedEx perspective, the one thing that we've observed globally as we've gone into different countries and, and expanded has been the importance of government enabling is is through trade facilitation. 
Now, it, it helps all firms, no doubt. But the Organisation for Economic uh, Cooperation Development, the OECD, very famous uh, organisation, has shown that improvements in trade facilitation environment benefit smaller firms than, more than larger ones. And of course, the smaller, the we've heard it a number of times today, the micro and the small to medium companies are the ones that are really going to benefit from e-commerce. So the trade facilitation reforms, they reduce you know, fixed and variable trade costs you know, helping the micro and small to mediums to not only become importers and exporters, but helping them, the ones that are already exporting and importing, to increase their volumes, open up new lanes, new countries and different ways of doing things. One of the things in Africa is, is to lower the cost of logistics, and that increases international intra-trade, uh, intra-Africa trade, especially within the African continental free trade area. Really important that, that the governments understand the role that they play in that. And trade facilitation reforms are key ingredient that really need to accom uh, accompany what we do on the physical logistics improvements, such as transportation, infrastructure development. Another point that was raised, uh, raised earlier by both both of my esteemed partners on this call. And look, infrastructure improvements are typically costly. We, we know that. And deficits present challenges to you know, traders, to the, the customs modernization, trade facilitation measurements. Um, you know, it all presents um, significant costs, but also, on the other hand, it drives significant value. So some of the key things that we look at at FedEx to really help drive trade are things like the pre-arrival processing and having those systems in place. They're particularly going to help new exporters and importers. Um, a separation of release of duty of uh, taxes and um, and and um, you know the various uh, value added taxes or whatever they may be. There also needs to be a commercially meaningful de minimis level. De minimis being the value of the goods um, uh, that you can import into a country at, at a duty-free or a very low tax rate. And we've seen countries that have a very high de minimis um, encourages trade because it means that the trade essentially can become free trade or minimal duties and tax involvement. And then, of course, the risk management procedures to facilitate trade reforms um, are critical, and they have the power to improve cost, speed, and security for cross-border trade. These are all things that FedEx have experienced around the globe as we've expanded in, in our nearly 50 years. But I really think trade facilitation is going to be one of the key drivers that the governments can help to enable uh, e-commerce um, within the continent of Africa. Thank you for that, Matt. I want to stay with you, actually, and, and, and ask you to dive down a little bit deeper into that. I appreciate that you acknowledge the key component of the physical infrastructure for all of that. And I thank you all for, for raising that because I do think that is an, as a critical enabler. But I wanna um, drill down on uh, the FedEx Express experience as an express retailer, um, because obviously you see the, the growth of e-commerce from a unique perspective. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that analysis, some of that broader logistics at large that you were just touching on? Um, what, um, what is the analysis that you have in terms of the key uh, re requirements that you see for really truly unleashing that growth um, between um, the, our African partners and the United States for this sector? Is there anything within that sort of mix that, that, that you would prioritize or how would you, yeah, how would you tackle I, that? I think a couple of, you know, one key thing. Yeah, look, there's, there's one key thing, I think, which is we've noticed that it's been critical in terms of that, and that is the role of the uh, of postal regulation in Africa. You know, delivery of small parcels, you know, fueled by by um, e-commerce growth. Yeah, what has seen has happened is regulations come in, in in local postal authorities, and they do make it make it difficult for, you know, companies like FedEx to really help enable, and they, they place, you know, um, a real, you know, uh, a focus on the way things are defined, the way operations done, speed and things like that as well. So we've even seen some governments, um, you know, propose very expansive regulations, try to create monopolies through the postal services, um, you know, and then create their own delivery e-commerce networks, um, which is great, but they quite often don't have the expertise that a company like a FedEx does. And what it does, it also reduces competition in a way that will reduce the region's competitiveness and deprive 
small to medium companies of their choice of, of delivery providers. And that's what we've seen around uh, around the world and the ability to be able to, to work with postal offices as opposed to be seen as competition is something that's really important to us. You know, the, the express delivery industry, and, and let's, let's be clear, FedEx move around uh, 99% of the, the GDP, we connect all of those countries together. So we do have some experience in this and, and free trade and the ability to be able to, uh, to have uh, an open um, uh, logistics supply chain enables exporters and, you know, and importers as well to be able to tap into this and build their own service network around that as well. Now, clearly, the ability to have a free run at, a, at an open market is one of the key success drivers that we've seen in e-commerce. And the explosion will continue on in the countries that continue to, to understand that the free trade and uh, a free uh, delivery, or not, not free in cost, but a free uh, and open logistics network will, will provide. Well, thank you. And noted, not free on cost, but I think that you really made a, a great case um, for, for what will really help actually physically move goods from place to place in a way that's meaningful for, for companies and for countries. Um, may I come to you, uh, Kuseni? Um, because I do think that there's a great correlation there, uh, given that uh, MassMart, and you touched on this, um, uh, MassMart announced a bold strategy uh, to expand e-commerce operations um, and to transform the online uh, shopping experience in South Africa and the other markets where you operate. Um, can you tell us why it's really uh, important for traditional retailers to take this step? Of this, there are three re main reasons I'd like to highlight for the purposes of this conversation, although I can touch on many. The first one is managing consumer expectations, which are in a state of flux, and we welcome that because consumers are our ultimate bosses. At MassMart, we see the digital revolution as an opportunity for us to better serve our customers. And that is why we are indeed investing in our business to meet customer expectations for a seamless omnichannel experience. As I mentioned earlier on, these expectations are constantly, if not rapidly changing. And it is imperative that we as retailers meet our customers' expectations. And that, that's exactly what we are doing. Our customers want us to respond to their expectations of when, where, and how to shop. It's not for us to determine that, it's for us to follow the lead from our customers. You can see that that commitment reflected in MassMart's diverse e-commerce offering through our own branded online stores, through our macro formats, the game format, as well as the builders format that we have. We've got our own specific online branded stores. And in addition to that, we also, present through the one cart online market experience. It's one of the re recent uh, acquisitions we've made uh, in the e-commerce space uh, to further build our capabilities in this area. And most recently, we've got many programs uh, such as uh, Vodacom, Vodapay, uh, super apps that we, are, we have, we have uh, entered into an arrangement with, with Vodacom, Vodacom being one of the major mob mobile players in South Africa. Digital transformation, in our view, will impact every sector of our economy in South Africa, Africa, and the world over. Successful businesses must therefore integrate digital tools in their ways of working and in their approach to business. The second reason for, for us to make the bet that we, we've made in this space is the resilience and recovery. The COVID crisis has shown us in many ways how rapidly both citizens and businesses have adopted digital tools, from remote working apps to retail applications that assist with home delivery or pick up from the stores, what we call click and collect. We also, how businesses developed e-commerce and other digitally enabled operations uh, in order to manage the COVID pandemic better. E-commerce is one way that retailers such as ourselves can expand our offering beyond what is available on our shelves, as I mentioned earlier on. This increase in choice adds flexibility in the supply chain and complements our tried and tested traditional distribution channels, not necessarily replace them totally. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is not just about business continuity. As we have passed peak disruption, 
by now, businesses who had adopted e-commerce, it has been shown uh, during the COVID era that their businesses did not just bounce back, but they managed to thrive. And then the last reason for, for, for us to take the step we have taken, we have taken at MassMart is that I strongly believe that traditional retailers that adopt e-commerce strategies play a unique and wider valuable role in enabling the broader digital transformation of the entire economy and sectors of the economy. By adopting digital tools, traditional retailers can leverage their network of customers and suppliers. We spoke earlier about the importance of building consumer confidence online in, in order to ensure that consumers have got access to diverse assortment of goods. Traditional retailers have an opportunity to build on pre-existing trusted relationships with their customers and in, by introducing them to the benefits of e-commerce as a complement to their normal shopping routine. For many of our suppliers, for example, it is often in the context of our supply chain that they are first onboarded into the digital economy. Sellers can benefit from our established distribution channels, efficient logistics network, and, and as well as the experience that we have with compliance requirements across the, the value chain. Small and local businesses that we work with stand to benefit from our experience and we willingly share that experience uh, with them, uh, especially in our builders warehouse business and macro business where we're servicing small and medium enterprises uh, as a source of supply for the goods that they sell. Thank you. Thank you for that, Kusini. Um, We have time for one last question, and I want to give it to Bohani um, to, to draw in uh, uh, Kusini's point about customers uh, looking for the when, where, and how to shop. A key how is using digital payments. So I want to uh, turn to Bohani um, and ask uh, a final question about how fintech um, and the financial services industry can really facilitate uh, greater adoption um, and of digitization and the growth. Um, of e-commerce as a disruptor from some of those traditional retail experiences that you spoke about and, and Kuseni just highlighted. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Kendra. I think fintechs are coming to solve uh, specific pain points in the ecosystem. And, you know, uh, what they bring is they bring the flexibility uh, that the big players generally just don't have. In our space, um, we're exploring various partnerships uh, around issues such as digitization of documents, around issues issues such as speed of payment, settlement uh, across multiple currencies, protection of data, use of data as well in terms of decision making, uh, and and tapping into markets that ordinarily would not have had access to as banks for one reason or the other. So fintechs are quite important in that they help us within the ecosystem to solve particular pain points. And in, in, in terms of you know, some of the pain points that I've mentioned, we as APSA group as well have been in various conversations with multiple fintechs, exploring potential partnerships because the way we look at it is the future is actually about partnerships, making sure that we can solve particular problems that help us enable um, you know, our relationships with our customers to flourish and in the process drive trade uh, within the continent. So that's how we look at it. Fintechs give us the flexibility that ordinarily you would not have as, as big players. And, and they will continue to be key as far as we can see in, in, in both in terms of driving intra Africa trade, but also driving trade um, with the US under the Algoa partnership. So from our perspective, fintechs are the way to go. Uh, and, and, and we're very excited to be exploring all these kinds of partnership in terms of those collaborations. Thank you. Thank you for that. And if I may just say, we are very excited for the key uh, insights that all three of you gentlemen shared with us today. We benefited greatly from the insights of APSA, FedEx Express and MassMart and the opportunities that there really are to, to grow e-commerce for the continent and to grow the bilateral partnership between the United States and, and Africa. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank you all and close this panel as we transition to our next uh, segment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Scott, I'm sorry, you're muted. Apologies for that, everyone. We are uh, unintentionally muted there, but I do want to just acknowledge the e-commerce panel, um, optimism you brought to the sector, the complex issues that you all discussed, and, and how do we bring the ecosystem necessary to accelerate Africa's exports through e-commerce are really what is going to drive a lot of the future engagements around the Goa, but even beyond that as we look towards uh, the African continental free trade areas and others. I'm pleased to continue the conversation with a thought leader, a friend of the chamber, someone who I've been fortunate enough to know and learn from uh, for over a decade now, and that is uh, Cabinet Secretary Betty Mina, mm -hmm. who leads the Ministry of Indust Industrialization, Trade and Enterprise Development in Kenya, a role she's held since February of 28, uh, 2020, sorry, throughout her career of public service, which is <laughs> various roles, Trade Minister of Environment Ministries, as well as a decorated leadership in the private sector, and really a strong, strong advocate for the Kenyan private sector over a number of, a number of years. Um, and we're pleased to work with her in collaboration of strengthening the relationship that we have with Kenya today. We were pleased to host CS Mina, President Kenyatta, and other leaders at the chamber in February of 2020 uh, to be the platform for President Kenyatta's announcement for his intention to pursue a free trade agreement with the United States. And hopefully something we'll hear a lot more about in the coming days and weeks ahead. The chamber remains committed to the to and advocates um, advocates that USTR resume these talks quickly. We know there's a lot of businesses that are uh, actively looking at the Kenyan market and the Kenya FTA with the United States is going to be a critical component of that. And Kenya seeks the same for its private sector as they want to open new opportunities for Kenyan uh, businesses to export and continue to be uh, a leader as around the AGOA um, export market such as they are today. She's so committed to the effort and the conversation around AGOA, bilateral trade, and, and the AFCFTA that this is not her first, but her second uh, participation in an official AGOA forum events today. So we're pleased to have you, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, it's wonderful to see you again and to, to partner with you. Um, today's conversation is, is going to be a fireside chat, so less speeches, more down in the weeds. Um, so thank you again for joining us, uh, CS. It's great to see you in your, in your offices. Kenya has been one of the highest utilization rates uh, of all of Sub-Saharan Africa when it comes to participating in Goa. Can you share with us what's been the secret to your success as a country uh, to drive that uh, that market access to the United States underneath the Goa, and where do you see opportunities in the future? Thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear what you've said about utilization of Goa because for Kenya, that really demonstrates uh, the depth of the partnership it has had with the United States, which has spanned more than uh, five uh, decades and covers different areas of cooperation from trade, from security, from uh, social development. And now the U.S. is also one of our strong uh, key partners in um, vaccine access as we all seek uh, to recover uh, from covid AGOA has facilitated expansion of uh, trade and investment between Kenya and the United States. Uh, the numbers from 2000, for instance, uh, our exports to the United States were, more, were about 235 million dollars, but in uh, that number has gone up. Uh, in 2019, it's about 667 million dollars. And the exports of, uh, to Kenya by the U.S. have also doubled uh, in, that, in that period. So this has been something that has been uh, quite uh, uh, instrumental. Now, our exports to the U.S. Uh, then, uh, are mostly textile and uh, footwear and apparel, as well as uh, agricultural goods that we are starting to see. Uh, increase uh, uh, significantly. So that's become, it's really facilitated entry into that market. Though apparently it's about 70% of our exports, but it has also enabled us to uh, attract uh, uh, investment. It's, uh, it's been an excellent uh, source of new areas for various uh, investors, especially from our export uh, processing zones. This obviously was a key entry point uh, for, 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 for Kenya to engage in Goa, but we would like to expand 
other uh, sectors. But what's one of the challenges of other sectors is just the challenges of entry into the US, especially the agro uh, and into the agro, agro market. But the Kenya government has also invested in a robust uh, infrastructure uh, for, 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 to support manufacturing and, uh, and, and logistics is a very key, uh, it's a very key uh, part of our, our investment. A third, um, um, a third activity by the government is the package of incentives that it provides, especially in the export uh, processing zones and uh, our own competitive environment enables us to attract a lot of foreign uh, investors to uh, participate with us in the EPZ. But we've also seen an increasingly uh, large number of uh, local firms that have entered the EPZ for the purposes of entry into the US market. And we've seen US investors come into uh, the Kenyan space also for purposes of entry, just not to the US market, but also to the rest of Africa. Thank you. Excellent, thanks so much. Thanks so much, CS. I know it would be remiss if I didn't raise the Kenya FTA and the important uh, the important posturing it has within the U.S. Uh, private sector. Obviously, the chamber has been a big champion for the U.S. Kenya FTA um, since its initiation back in February of 2020, which, uh, in light of COVID, really seems like a couple of decades ago that we've been negotiating that. Um, but we know that the that the importance of digital economy will have in any agreement going forward. Uh, and and how uh, prominent it will have to play given the advancements we've heard about in the discussion today. Can you share with us some of the insights that the Kenyan government has about um, uh, what role the private sector uh, will have and, and where promoting digital trade between the United States and Kenya will come into play, whether it's in this FTA or next iterations of trade with, with Kenya, where do you see the, the digital economy playing that, that significant role? Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, one. It is true that the, the Kenya government and the U.S. government uh, started discussions on an FTA last year. It's an exciting, uh, it's an exciting development, but it's really also um, uh, inspired or provoked by the fact that Goa is set to end in 2025. Over the next two days, I guess we will hear a lot more about what uh, what's the direction and thoughts around it from the U.S. side on Nagoa post 2025. But it's important to create a predictable uh, trading framework and uh, that will inspire uh, our markets uh, and, and, and inspire our investors. Now, in the context of the FTA, we expect that uh, you know digital and uh, the digital trade will uh, form part and parcel of our conversations. The government of Kenya is committed to ensuring meaningful uptake of technology innovations to enhance and facilitate sustainable trade and industrial growth through digital transformation. We continue to provide leadership in the ICT sector in Africa and the world through utilization of digital trade, including the transformation that technological advancements have made possible for the entertainment uh, business, agribusiness, manufacturing, distribution, and logistics. And I'm actually quite glad that this is coming at the, you know, at the end of the panel on e-commerce. Uh, the government is spearheading reforms and implementing measures to create a more conducive and vibrant environment for the private sector for digital trade uh, to flourish. Among some of these reforms includes the development of a digital economy blueprint uh, in 2019. And the blueprint has five pillars, uh, which is a digital government. And, uh, and to date, the Kenya government has more than 200 digitized services offered through our Uduma centers countries, uh, countrywide, as well as an online uh, government services platform we call uh, eCitizen. E e These platforms offer one-stop access to essential services, such as applying for passports or national identification cards and registration of business, births, or deaths. We also have e-government services in filing of tax returns, 
uh, land registries, court procedures, and uh, rulings, and public service records. Uh, second pillar is on digital business, which is developing a robust marketplace for digital trade and digital financial services. A third is the infrastructure, which is the availability of affordable and accessible, resilient and reliable uh, infrastructure. Uh, in, and the uh, fourth one is on innovation and uh, driven entrepreneurship and really supporting a lot of our tech-based uh, startups. And then uh, fifthly is building on uh, digital skills and values and uh, education uh, and education and training to enable um, much better, uh, better skill base. We've also launched a national ICT policy, which uh, focuses on requirements for the design and development of uh, uh, acquisition, deployment, operation, and support of uh, public and private ICT um, sectors. To support this, we've also launched a national broadband uh, strategy and we continue to invest in a broadband network and infrastructure around uh, uh, the country. Currently, Kenya has about 53.3% geographical coverage of mobile broadband, 3G and 4G, and 96.5% uh, of our Kenyan population can access mobile broadband services, which is excellent for rollout of uh, digitally enabled uh, services uh, and trade. And I'm, I'm sure I've saw, now that's basically the backdrop that will support uh, digital services and digital, uh, and particularly digital trade and digital uh, and digital government. We also have, uh, you know, on the domestic level, the government has developed programs to support uh, the private sector, including SMEs, to facilitate uptake of technologies, while also supporting the trade and investment sectors with technical and financial support to implement sustainable industrialization strategies. And the private sector, uh, our, you know, our telco company, for instance, like Safaricom, is really um, expanding how it can offer more and more uh, services uh, to businesses uh, digitally. So we, we want to ensure that our country can achieve that global goal of ensuring that Kenya and the wider East African region can engage in sustainable business practices by giving more attention to green businesses, including technological innovations that drive manufacturing, energy production, supply and consumption, and agri uh, business. So we want to build back better after COVID, but we believe that uh, the digital way and the tech way is the way to go. Yeah, excellent. Thank you very much for that uh, in-depth analysis of where you've been putting in the, the brick and mortar to make sure that the future pathways of trade between the United States and Africa and Africa and, and the region and, and kind of more broadly are, are in place as we as we do build back better or at least uh, get to our, our sure footing again and, and be able to trade uh, like we have in the past. I know we've feel probably for you, CS, that uh, that you've been on a, an, an existing AGOA conference call now for a better part of four or five hours of your day, given this is your second panel. So maybe um, I will bring us uh, around the corner, knowing your schedule is quite packed to, to kind of a forward looking conversation as we as we round out this discussion is you know, two things. One, where do you see the future of US Africa trade or, or trade within Africa growing out of the AFC FTA? A lot of conversation has come in that, you know, where do you see the role of digital economy? I know you just touched on it. Kenya has been such a big leader in mobile money payments, Safari, as you said, Safaricom with Mpesa. Um, being really um, impactful in your in your contributions to the creative economy uh, and the creative industries that you noted that'll be growing, and we'll talk about that in just a moment with our next panel. And then, where do you see that that jump of innovation? You know, Kenya, as I mentioned, has long been kind of an innovative platform for companies to see the future. And so, as you look as we round out today's conversation, what does that future of trade within the Kenyan East Africa community? relationship in the Kenya AOC FTA, because obviously American companies that want to invest in in the market want to see the biggest market as possible. So what are what are the things that we should be looking for in the future from, from our relationship? Oh, thank you. I think we're keen. Uh, this is, like you said, similar to your previous question. Uh, we really want to highlight the fact that Kenya and many other African countries are really keen 
to ensure meaningful uptake of technology innovations to enhance and facilitate sustainable trade and industrial growth. So we are quite open to newer and new transformative technologies to drive our industrialization agenda. We have currently, we have started to you know, uh, invest and develop our own capacity to make, uh, like I usually say, things for the internet of, of things. So production, uh, you know, production capability is, uh, is, is, you know, is certainly you know, being enhanced and therefore there's a lot of space and partnership for US firms that can support, uh, can make the necessary investment in making the things for the internet um, of things and uh, and even working in, with our tech, uh, tech, tech startups. So in our, in our view, so even the FTA uh, that we are negotiating should be, is, is, we have the ambition of using that to be able to build up our own uh, capacity to produce uh, and produce the, the goods that will fire and also to just innovate uh, the services. We've been quite, I think you, you, you've mentioned that, but on things like you know mobile money and, uh, and, 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 and other related services, Kenya has been at the forefront uh, of that and using the platforms like of our, of our telcos, there's been a lot of expansion uh, of many, many other other services. I was reading in the paper today that you actually rarely have to go through to an ATM these days to just collect money because it's possible to transact and to handle a lot of your account just on your mobile, by, by, by phone. But the nice thing about it is that it actually has expanded uh, services. So it's also possible to transact with, tra you know, with, with, with strangers across uh, the country without necessarily having to meet meet them because that's been and then they, that that have, they've been digitally enabled. So if we can now support the growth of these services with more manufacturing uh, of the related uh, products, that would be a good opportunity. And the U.S. industries can therefore partner with um, African governments in developing the ICT and R and D. Uh, infrastructure, but also in the development and um, uh, at least customizing a lot of the services to the African market, and also in the being able to uh, expand their services in the context of the Africa continental uh, free free you know, free trade area. Excellent. Well. Cabinet Secretary, it's been a, a pleasure to, to join you for today's conversation. Thank you for your, your long friendship with the Chamber from your previous role supporting the Kenyan private sector to now uh, supporting a kind of a broader reach of the Kenyan government into enticing new investments into the Kenyan market as it looks to be a hub for American companies and companies globally. I think uh, where we sit today is, is a really exciting time to partner and grow with the Kenyan market. The chamber is and will for a long time be a friend and an ally of the Kenyan private sector with working with our Amchans and of yours and with KEPSA and, and uh, Kenyan Chamber of Commerce and others. If we can get this uh, Kenya FTA started again, and I hope friends of USTR are listening, it is a priority for the private sector, the business community. I know we've seen great bipartisan support across Congress for, for a deal to get restarted and moving forward. So. We'll continue to press our friends and our allies and partners in the U.S. government. I know you'll do the same on your side. We really do value um, the moments you spent with us today. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now shifting gears just a little bit. I want to pick up the theme of what's going to launch Africa's next big export market. And we think that there's a prime role here for the creative industries. And we're very excited uh, right before we're going to lead into our next panel to have Dr. Uzo Awela, CEO of the Africa Center, to join us for a brief fireside chat on how he's seen the transformation of Africa's creative industry grow over the years. As many of you know, he's an esteemed author, uh, producer, uh, social impact uh, uh, in, in innovator, and, and really has been a, a become a trusted friend and ally as we've become uh, more uh, interested in the business sector about what is the next generation of exports from Africa. So thank you, Uzo, uh, Dr. Uzo, if you will, for, for joining us today for today's conversation. 
as I mentioned, the creative industry has seen a huge explosion over the years across the continent, whether it be in Nollywood, through what the Nigerian film industry has seen. You've seen, uh, obviously, the rise of record labels of, of Maven uh, and Don Jazzy, which we'll hear from in just a little while on the panel. Um, and you've seen, obviously, South Africa's uh, production industry grow, and we'll hear a little bit about that as well in, in UNESCO and the AU or, or deeming this year the Africa Year of Heritage. So Uzo, where do you see the role of African exports from a creative angle coming into the world stage? And how does that really change the way that we perceive uh, the opportunities on the continent? Well, first, Scott, I just want to say thanks for having me here. And it's always good to see you. Uh, hopefully see you soon in person uh, when we can. But, you know, on the, on the idea of creative industries, I think the, there are a couple of things to think about. And the first is to just to go back and, and recognize just how influential the African continent and the diaspora has been just in the formation of, of creativity, but also in the creative industries from the very beginning. Like whether we're talking about music, whether we're talking about literature, whether we're talking about film, from the time that the continent has been interacting with the wider world, we have had a profound influence on the way we, we, we push culture out into the world and the way that people use culture to represent who we are as the various peoples we are in this world. So I think it's important to start from that and then to think about what's happening now, right, within that, as, as an evolution from, well, before the, the contribution wasn't as acknowledged to now, it's acknowledged both in the, in the, the sense that people are saying, look, this is, these are the antecedents of, of, of so much creativity, but also then in a commercial way, which is allowing people to actually gain value from the work that they're doing as opposed to being passed over in that sense. And so you know, when I think about it in that way, I mean, like there's, you know, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with that evolution. I, I'm pretty positive about where things are going because I think it will only grow as more young Africans on the continent and in, in the diaspora recognize not only the extent of their creative power, but also the economic power associated with that. And as the wider world comes to understand that, and you mentioned a couple of things. You mentioned Don Jazzy uh, and, and Maven Records, for example, as music labels from Nigeria, there are others across the continent. You mentioned the film industries. You know, and if you look at some of uh, the major corporations, whether you're talking about things like Afrex and Bank on the continent, investing a huge amount of money in African creativity in the film music uh, sectors, or you're looking at uh, the, the Netflix, which I think is, is small at this point in time, but I'm sure everyone's seen that whole competition that they've announced, $75,000 to um, African continentally based creatives. There's an acknowledgement, and you know, I'm just gonna tweak Netflix a little bit because they, they can do a lot more. They should do a lot more, especially considering the amount of talent, but there is an acknowledgement that like, look, there's a whole generation of creative talents um, and you know, it's not just the talent, it's the ideas and the ability I think that's being acknowledged and that people will see will only grow. I mean, the other day I was on a plane um, because I guess we do that now. Um, and I was, I was, uh, I can't remember, it was a Nollywood film that I watched and I was just struck because it's like, you know, you're, you're 20, 30 years in now and you look at the quality of the film, the quality of the acting, like the subject matters, again, like it was a, it was kind of like one of those like bro comedy flicks, like a bro crime comedy, which I don't think you would have necessarily seen even 10 years ago, but that's all about conversation. It's about connection. It's, and again, production value is about like having the tools, having the investment, but also the fact that it's becoming cheaper to make really high quality things that allows more people to take part in, in the creative economies. And that's only a positive. I mean, all you need these days is an iPhone and a decent script, and you can produce a pretty well quality, you know, film that you can upload in minutes and have the world see and, and really enjoy. It's it's been terrific to see that evolution from what looked like a beta cam to where we are today. Right, it's very true. I mean, and, and even just like think about like you know renowned filmmakers like Steven Soderbergh. I think that film High Flying Bird was shot entirely on an iPhone, right, or on iPhones. You know, the film Tangerine was shot on iPhones, and think about what people are looking at. Um, when they see that and doing that on the continent, you know, and then doing it with also equipment that's more expensive. I'm not saying that like it should be iPhone based production only, but I'm just saying the what you're able to do now and how you're able to impact both economically and also, you know, in terms of putting your ideas and your stories out into the world is really amazing with the tools that we have. Yeah. And, and through the Africa Center, you've done an amazing job of raising the visibility of African cultural, the impact of diaspora in the United States and how much of an amazing positive influence over centuries, really. Um, that has become on, on society. What more do you think can be done from a U.S. perspective to incentivize the growth of the creative industries as a means to 
um, sharing new stories to to whether it's in the United States, but globally, but in the context of this conversation around AGOA uh, and increasing trade lanes between the United States and the continent, what more could be done perhaps from a US perspective um, to incentivize you know, investors to look at Africa as an opportunity for the creative industry's growth? Sure. And, you know, I think the creative industries are always tricky, Scott, because people tend to think of them as like that fluffy stuff over there. But I think first and foremost, what you are doing and what some other folks are doing, I think, you know, really emphasizing this as a serious aspect of economic performance, right, and economic growth, I think is the first and foremost thing. When people get down to, you know, and I'm, look, I come from the fluffier side of things, like I write novels, you know, I wouldn't exactly say that I'm necessarily, you know, the, the sort of like high-flying movie mogul or anything like that. But I think, you know, there is there is a need to really get down to the commercial aspects of things and to show people that like a dollar invested here is worth 10 earned later. And it's not just, you know, on the money front in terms of like what you directly pull out of whether it's, you know, an, uh, a, a record label or a production house or whatever. It's also on perception changing, right? Because a dollar invested here might change someone's perception that equals $10 million invested later or, you know, 100, but whatever it is. And I'm just saying that has to be a part and parcel of our of our, our conversation and our calculation that the reason why you invest in creative industries is not just because you're going to create immediate jobs and it's not just because you're going to pull out money now, it's because you, you, you create an environment and it's environment seeding, environment creating, world building essentially to use a creative term that we have to be more cognizant of and more effective at as Africans and diaspora people. You know, if you think about Hollywood and what Hollywood is able to do for the American image abroad, that was a deliberate investment. I mean, you know, you go into a movie theater and you see US Army advertisements in movie theaters. That's not by chance. That's, in, that's an important way of the government saying, listen, this is important to us and pushing these messages are important to us. We need to think like that and for like this actually allows to do that to start. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I, the way that we perceive things visually and audibly and what we what we read on paper are going to shift and change our impressions. And I think there was a study a couple of years ago by USC Annenberg that um, I think it was the Annenberg School at least yep. uh, pretty much noted noted that uh, like something in the 70 percent range of perceptions on screen or, or read or otherwise were pretty much negative on the continent. It was drugs, war. Uh, famine, things that weren't necessarily positive. So it's exciting to see what you and others in the industry are doing to really change perceptions. And you, know, you look at Spotify and folks that are doing collaborations nowadays um, with with you know Beyonces and the Jay Zs of the world. It's it's you wouldn't have thought that would happen five or six years ago. And now it's you know mainstream every day. But uh, talk a little bit about um, kind of the job creation element. I think that's overlooked at how massive undertaking you know, a movie production is, for instance, and I know you've been involved in a couple. Uh, what what can we do to help make sure that the skills transfer is taking place on the continent so that, that when you, that it's not just South Africa that creates a booming production right. studio landscape? And what more could we do to partner and incentivize governments to think broadly about, you know, other industries? And it's not just core manufacturing industrialization. Right. And you know, what's interesting is I think this is so much connected to the, to the thing we were just talking about, which is the image building. I'll just tell you a story. Uh, Beasts of No Nation, which was the film that was made of my my first novel, um, you know, I desperately wanted um, for the producers, for the director, and they were great about this and really trying to make it, um, you know, as true and authentic as possible. I really wanted it to be shot in West Africa, and they honored that in a sense. And, you know, the part of me that's Nigerian really wanted it to be shot in Nigeria, but we couldn't shoot it in Nigeria because of, uh, you know, just risk, right? Like the bond on production was too high, and so they went and shot it in Ghana. Um, and, you know, there are a couple of things that I learned from that. One is like, there's just a whole uh, sort of like business infrastructure ecosystem around this that is important that certain countries have figured out, right, around, you know, why you would grant, for example, tax incentives or why you would, uh, like, you know, why you really work on your image to attract these productions because they do employ people. And then the second part of this is that, like, you know, if you're on a movie set, right, like, there are about a thousand people who are doing highly specialized jobs who are getting paid decently to do that work. Um, you know, and half of them, you don't even really know what they're doing, but they're there and they're essential to the, to the making of the production. And there's a certain amount of that that we need to really think about. How do you bring people into shoot production so you can skills transfer? And I think that's, a, that's an important thing. So it's first image so people feel comfortable shooting, giving people incentives to actually do some of that creative production. And again, we're talking about film, but this could be across the board. And then, you know, the third is then making sure that in that production, there's a skills transfer so that you're learning you know, in terms of some of the technical stuff from people who've been doing this for a long time. Additionally to that, I think I would say, 
you also have to make sure that you're not being swept along and saying that the way that these people do that is better because innovation is so important in terms of your own homegrown industry, right? It's how do you take what you've seen around the world, twist it, you know, turn it as, you know, to use a term like from, for, you know, the producer might use, freak it, right? Like freak the beat so that you're now bringing in your own ideas and creating your own technical knowledge for the environment that you're in. And from that grows a whole new set of jobs, a whole new idea of what it means to put together, like, you know, it's the essential economic package that allows for that growth. You know, again, if you're talking about creative industries, you're not going to employ 10 billion people. You're not going to employ, you know, like, but what you're doing is for each one of those productions or for each one of those jobs, there's so many knock on things. So it's, you might have now a music studio that forms because you need the, the, the soundtrack. You might have people who are doing costumes, right, and design. You've got carpenters and skilled laborers who are putting together sets. All that stuff equals employment and it just blossoms outward from your production. Same is true for music, same is true for so many of these things. Like we should include tourism in there and all that sort of stuff. And so, you know, all I'm saying is like, you have to be, like you have to think deliberately about this. And again, you know, you can't, you can't expect that doing one production is gonna create a million jobs and solve your youth employment situation. But what it does is it gives people the idea that like there's, there's a possibility here and it allows people to imagine, you know, that is the point of the creative industry is like how you can grow. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I think one of the amazing parts of the creative industry is, is I don't want to be age specific, but it does tend to capture the imagination of, of younger individuals and that labor force that's created outside of that. And given the, the youth bulge on the continent that's, you know, coming up, you know, Nigeria by what, 2050, we'll have more people living in it than in the United States, for instance. Um, and just to see those staggering numbers of growth, I think the creative industries give an easy on-ramp and a bridge to a lot of people who might not otherwise think of themselves as having opportunities. So I think this evolution of streaming and platforms and creation, even within the digital space when it comes to, which is a lot of today's conversation, when it comes to app development or e-commerce or what have you, is going to be really critical. We're a little bit short on time. I know you are a very busy individual writing books, producing things, teaching the world about all the amazing creative and cultural exports from the continent. What kind of last words do you want to share with us today? Uh, well, first, I want to say thanks to you all um, for putting this on blast, right? Like, I think the more that we talk about it, the more it becomes real for people and the more it becomes real for policymakers as well, right? It's not just the director or the writer or the music person who's like laboring away with the love of an artist. It's people who can help to build the ecosystem that allows them to thrive. And I think that's really, really necessary. Um, and then the only other thing I would say is just, you know, watch the space, right? Because there's so much talent and there's so many amazing things that are coming out. I've seen in the last two months, so many really amazing films. Um, I was just talking with my sister the other day about hearing Ebo music on like Hot 97 in New York, which is just crazy. And it, you know, so watch the space because the collaborations and the influence is only growing. Yeah, well, thank you very much. We look forward to future partnerships with the Africa Center with you. Anytime you want to do a movie screening at the chamber, you're more than welcome or a book reading or anything. We're, we're all in and we think really we're in partnership with you. That This is really the, going to be the galvanizing force and dispelling a lot of the myths that we get a little bit frustrated here in the United States about how people perceive the African continent as a whole, not, not uh, only underscoring the fact that there are 54 amazing markets out there that really do each have their own vibrancy and, and rhythm and beat to them. So look forward to this and future conversations with you. Thanks again, Uzo. Let's do it. Thank you, Scott. All right. Pleasure. Excellent. Thank you. And thanks for bearing with us as we had a little bit of a technical glitches here and there. I want to take our conversation with Uzo one step further and bring in investors and deciders that are making decisions about how the creative industry is viewed uh, globally, but also how it's a growing export for uh, African uh, markets, uh, both internally and externally. And we're pleased to welcome a series of speakers. We've got uh, impact investors from Kapanda Capital, a member of the board of Maven Records. We've got an assistant director general for Africa at UNESCO, and we've got the Senior Vice President of Government Relations, Incentives and Production Planning at HBO Max, which in my mind, that's the position that decides where they're gonna go do a film here in the here in the not too distant future. So let's bring all of these distinguished experts into uh, this next tranche of conversation, if you would. We could have uh, Linda, 
His Excellency uh, Mat Matoko and uh, Mr. J. Rowe. Excellent. Welcome, welcome. Thank you all for joining us today. I think what we heard from Uzo really does lay the groundwork for the rest of our conversation. Uh, exports uh, out of Africa traditionally looked at uh, solid goods, things I can hold in my hand uh, and move around quite easily and that are, that are manufactured in the context of industrialization. We forget about the amazing export that is in the creative industry that comes out of the continent. I think it's really come to its heyday, as Uzo was saying, that you can hear Ebo music on Hot 97. Uh, you might not have thought about that uh, even a year ago, perhaps. So I want to bridge a question to you all as we really dive into this conversation. Um, the COVID pandemic has been a huge disruptor. We know that. It's clear in every day of our lives. The fact that we're not sitting in person and we're sitting in our in our living rooms or our offices uh, makes the case the digital economy and, the, and, and how it's really grown. But the creative sector over the last year has really exploded. Uh, in so many fascinating and amazing ways. Um, so I do want to call on each of you to, to lean in a little bit and give us your perspectives on how this digital economy, e-commerce evolution has really accel accelerated opportunities for the African creative industry. And perhaps I will start with His Excellency uh, Matoko from UNESCO. I think you're on mute, sir. Okay. There you are. Uh, thank you. Thank you all very much for inviting me to this uh, conversation. And uh, good good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, I was uh, listening uh, to the first part of the conversation. I went, before I joined you, I went into the internet to look at uh, the, what is Agoa. I mean, I, I, I knew Agoa for, from, for, for, from uh, my previous lectures. But then uh, I was wondering why is UNESCO in this conversation not being in this uh, business of, uh, of exports or in, the, in a financial institution. But and then listening to the last speaker, I do realize that, uh, uh, yes, we have to be a part of this conversation. Those who are not uh, actually doing business, but could, could uh, contribute to uh, uh, with with uh, some ideas basic idea to better understand the reality out there there is something that you have to understand um, uh, about africa uh, whatever the the conversation you have this africa is not an homogeneous continent we look at countries like nigeria south africa fine but you have uh, you have a lot of countries that are out of the picture the business out of the digital economy and a large number of the population who do not have, have access uh, to those uh, infrastructures that would uh, allow them to be connected or to be part of this uh, this uh, this business. So, answering your question, answering your question, uh, the COVID-19 has demonstrated, has confirmed the need for the African creative scene to structure itself and strengthen its ecosystem. For a more efficient creation of value chain, value chain attracting talents and wealth creating investment. Uh, uh, as a way of introduction, while in, a, in, in Europe during the COVID 19 or United States, the Council of Fashion Design of America or the French Ready to Wear Federation saved the future of their creative industries by providing financial supports, public financial supports. Uh, to the to the artist or to the uh, to the sector, how many African government have been able to support the creative industries in Africa? Very few, if not not very few countries were able to provide that financial support. What is the reality now? If you look at the the scene in Africa, good. We have uh, Netflix. We have uh, all these uh, streaming platform that have gain space in Africa with uh, in uh, in uh, connecting with uh, with, uh, with America with the American continent of Europe but you also have a large majority of African artists that just to use a, a, a word from the United Nations that are left behind they don't have access to the new technology they don't have financial support 
to be connected uh, with the rest of the world. And it is important that also we put the finger on that reality. And uh, it's important that in our discussion, in expanding the, 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 the trade with Africa uh, from the United States, there is also uh, uh, this particular uh, looking at the, the part of the Africa uh, which unfortunately is not cannot uh, benefit from this new digital economy. What can we do? Build infrastructure, support the the the, the technolo technological infrastructure, provide the financial support to those young people, and most of them are young people, young artists. Uh, I just uh, I will stop here as a way of introducing my arguments, and uh, thank you again for inviting me to this conversation. Thank Excellent. you. Many, many thanks, Your Excellency. Jay, I want to come to you with a very similar question. You've been ramping up production on the continent for some time. Uh, obviously, HBO, HBO Max is, is seeing the opportunities on the continent. How has this digital evolution in last year's kind of rapid acceleration impacted the way you're thinking about investments and that translates to the global markets? Thank you, Scott. And it's an honor to be here today with all of you. And thank you for inviting me. Um, I think, Scott, the, what, 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 first of all, I think what COVID has done, number one, is realize we're all connected right across this planet, um, almost a metaphor for the way that we are, you know, what the future is going to be like. Number two, and how are we connected? The connecting ability beyond the COVID virus is the digital commerce, right? This is how we're going to be connected. And as you look, whether or not it's a phone or a television, et cetera, this is the future. And I think COVID has also pushed us into the future in a way to realize that not only through the, the virus are we connected, but now digitally, th this is where it's gonna be. And what that has what, ha what has occurred as a result of that is as we all stayed home, what do we turn to? We turn to our television, we turn to our cell phone, do we turn to the way to reach out into the world? And so it's clearly brought to us the, the reality that content is the future, it's the way we're gonna connect. And so what that's happened to us is to see this incredible surge and need for what we do and with that economic money coming into our sector in a way that we've never seen before. And out of that comes the result that we want to, we want content, we want content around the world, we want content we wanna share. And in particular, Africa being one of those places which I think there's incredible intrigue with. We've had some rich experiences there across Warner Media from Warner Brothers Features to HBO to CNN, Turner Broadcasting, all of the Warner Media content platforms. And we've had the opportunities to film in Morocco. We've been in Rwanda. We've been in Botswana with number one ladies detectives. We've been in South Africa, um, most recently with Raised by Wolves. And it's, it's not only an opportunity for us to bring and become a partner with people all across Africa, which I think we're intrigued with, the world is intrigued with, but it's to get the world of Africa out to the rest of the world. And I think because many of the challenges of, of the continent as a whole, there's incredible interest. Um, and given the struggles that, that some of the continent has gone through, there's, there's incredible stories there. So I think it's an opportune time for us to partner with people, to bring the stories of Africa to the rest of the world, and for us to work with you to build up this incredible infrastructure around this content creation, which we are right in the middle of. Many thanks, Jay. I think you're exactly right. The, the shifting of perceptions and the amazing impact that you all can have um, towards everyday American citizens, but global audiences is how they change the view of what they think about individual countries and the collective countries of Africa is really impactful and incredibly important now more than ever. Linda, I want to come to you. I'm going to double down let you answer that first question about how digitization has really enabled you in the in the COVID environment to uh, to spur along your business as an investor, as someone who's gone to the capital markets to raise funds to invest in Africa. What's changing the landscape for you as you look forward? But I do want to come back to to the concept of you know what's leveraging for the future. How do you take those stories? Africa so rich in music and oral history, and how do we take those stories to the next level of export? Yeah, thank you again. Thanks, to Scott and the Chamber for organizing this really exciting discussion. And the first thing I'd like to highlight is that COVID was something that we were extremely worried about, but we actually saw between 2019 and 2020, 80% year-on-year growth from a very already robust streaming baseline. 
So I think it speaks to what Jay was speaking to the interconnectivity of the world and really how much everyone is really seeking to hear these stories and just hear the music. For us, you know, Maven started off as a lot of a physical business and it was performance-based. It has shifted tremendously even before COVID to digitization. It's well worth noting that the opportunity to have a music catalog, a lot of the Western companies who are in the recorded music industry, it represents the opportunity for digital annuity. And Africa entering the scene presents the opportunity for that money to be coming to the continent. Um, globally, over 60% of recorded music sales is now coming from streaming. And Mavid is definitely benefiting from that trend. It's able to bring African culture to the world. Um, you're seeing a lot of popular music. You're seeing the likes of WizKid, but our Rema, who's on Don Jazzy's platform, also just, I'm hearing the music in, you know, small cafes in Upper Northwest where I would just not expect to hear it. And so it is representing that, you know, this music is really crossing boundaries. Thanks. Thanks very much. Looking a little bit down the road, how do we capture more of this new export? You know, how do we drive um, next generation of, of cross-border investments between companies like yours and, and Maven? You know, your you know, between what HBO's done, what we hear about Netflix and what you all have done, you know, it's it's a great starting point, but it's more is out there uh, as Uzo was alluding to in our conversation. So how are you judging future investments on the continent um, now that there is this much more connected universe? Yeah, so for us, I might, some of my suggestions and some of the things that would help our business in a very pragmatic way, some of them seem very basic. The first thing is, our performers need to get out to the world in order to perform and have that live connection with their music. So some of it is, is as simple as visas. Now, our main markets right now, where we're hearing a lot of, where we're seeing a lot of our streaming revenue come from, of course, are the United States, France, Canada. And we hope in the future for a lot of the revenues to come from, streaming revenues to come from across Africa. So as many of our previous speakers alluded to, it is investing in that physical infrastructure that will actually make listening and streaming our music cheaper on the continent as well. So we, we actually are very excited for when that comes to bear. Excellent, thanks so much. I think it's a great pivot back to you, Jay, and I'll, I'll come to you, Your Excellency, after Jay. You know, Linda's talked a little bit about that investment needs to be made in infrastructure. Obviously, we won't talk about what's going on in the port of Los Angeles and the backup there. Um, but what are the investments that governments and the regulatory environment that you all look toward when considering investments in the production facilities and the skills development? What are the, the tangible and intangible benefits that those investments deliver? Uh, and how can how can the business community help to support the greater growth of the, of the production value and investments in the creative industry? from where you sit at HBO, HBO Max. Great, thank you, Scott. Yes, and there's a couple themes that, that have been coming through this morning that I that fall right into this. First, there's incentives. Our, our sector is driven by incentives, and South Africa in particular, but other parts of the, the continent well have stepped into the incentive world. So when we see an incentive, we realize that the government, it sends a sign out to the rest of the world that we want to invest in your sector, we want to become a partner. So number one, a stable incentive is helpful. It's not absolutely necessary, but it certainly is a number one, it's, it, it is one of the things we look for. Number two, we look for strong infrastructure and people have talked about infrastructure. What's interesting is people often think of infrastructure in the bricks and mortar side of things, which is really what our industry is about as well. We need stages to film in, we need equipment to work with, we need train crews, and we cross a lot of different skills and craft sectors. So uh, infrastructure in our business actually is very wide reaching and rarely developmental. And so we look to partner with production companies on the ground, with the government, to bring and train up the skills that are needed for our particular industry, which is wide, very quite wide ranging from people in front of the camera, the actors, the directors and the writers to behind the camera, which is where 80% of the work takes place, which are the crafts people, the makeup and hair people, the wardrobe people, construction people, the drivers. It's a very interesting business from that standpoint. And some of those skills can actually be transferred 
from some other businesses into our our sector. So it's it's a very very uh, potentially stimulating sector when we come in and, and we employ all of these people. And then the government support. We look for the government support not only as as Linda was saying with visas, getting people in and out of the country. We look for government support to help with the bureaucracy, helping us with locations, helping us with what we need in order to have our very dynamic business work. So we look at this as a partnership with the government, with companies on the ground to support us and work with us in a way. And when we bring our, our shows there, and some of them international at the same time, hopefully working with local content, it is a skills industry where we train people up very quickly. It is a craft business that way. So again, the theme of partnership and infrastructure, uh, very important that way. And we, we do this everywhere we go. So we want to partner with people more, more across all of Africa so that we can bring your content to the world, as well as being able to come and film our content in your continent. Jay, I think that's an incredibly important point you made there about the job creation element that comes from the creative industry. It's not just the person you see on the screen. It's the thousands, literally thousands of jobs behind that one scene they're going to get recorded or behind that record studio um, you know, label that's coming out with its, with its new opportunity because of the concert scene behind it, the live performance that Linda talked about. You know, Your Excellency um, Matoko, UNESCO came out with a really powerful report um, over the last number of months talking to the the dollar and economic impact that the cultural uh, and, and creative industries has on the continent and the potential area for growth. Could you give us a little bit of flavor as to that report, where it's going and how that might shape decisions by a Linda uh, or a Jay and their respective industries as they look towards future investments? Yes, uh, thank you, thank you again. But let, let me uh, let me add, add another dimension of what was uh, your first question. Um, you know, something uh, in Africa which is really, really missing, it's uh, the legal vacuum. I mean, that around the intellectual property rights in many countries of Africa, our artists do not know how to protect their their their, their properties. And there are many cases of uh, pleasure uh, or, or just people using the African music uh, reproducing without the consent of the, of the authors. And that is important also to underline that uh, 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 in America, for example, there are laws that protect uh, uh, the, the, the artists in Europe too, and we don't have in many countries in Africa those laws. So that's one dimension that I think that we should invest on and training also uh, the, the, the African to protect their own industries. Uh, on the, on, the, on the, the, the report that we just recently uh, launched on the African film industry. Uh, we know how much uh, this uh, industry is going up uh, uh, to Africa, and we know how much African uh, uh, love very much the movies. Uh, and uh, but we 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 very few of us do know actually the reality of the African. We know about Nollywood. We know about Netflix. As I said at the beginning, Africa is not only one continent, it's many, many continents within one, one, one space. Uh, and uh, that report shows that uh, uh, there are different realities, but basically uh, uh, it is a promising industry that uh, probably you from the United States should support, not only from the big industry or like, uh, like uh, Nollywood, uh, which by the way is the second employer in Nigeria, but also small movie industries that are going up in, in, in Africa. And the report proposed uh, four strategic developments and models. Uh, the first one is, of course, the Nollywood, Nollywood model, which relies on commercial, homegrown markets. The second one is the author model, which is driven by a vision of, of cinema as an art. Um, the third one is a service model, which developed by servicing the global market, and this is um, also interesting, very interesting. And the fourth one is the festival model. We know of the FESPACO, which is taking place right, right now. There, there are many, many other festivals taking place in Africa, which are not really, which has not, promo which are not promoted, and where you have a lot of creativity from African uh, uh, authors, and that needs also to be uh, highlighted. So I, I hope in our conversation in the Agora uh, uh, vision. 
uh, this new industry uh, uh, will be also uh, given much attention, uh, special attention, but looking at the reality of the African economies, not only from the point of view of America or, or, or the Europe, European uh, uh, countries. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for the for the comments and the insights into the four pillars of the report. I know, you know, intellectual property protections is is part and parcel part of the chamber's DNA. I I can speak, I'm sure, for Linda and Jay that without those intellectual property protections, it'd be very, very hard to make future investments into uh, productions, into into new artists, and we really do need to work on a common set of uniform principles um, around intellectual property protections on the continent um, for the artist's sake and for, and for the for the community's sake. I want to pull this conversation back um, to a, a question for all as we start to round out today's talk. This isn't the, the end of a conversation. This is the beginning of a new era in, in how we evaluate exports from the continent that goes well beyond physical goods, as I started out saying today, to the intellectual goods that are being produced by so many artists. What is it that governments can do to look at and establish a greater utilization of either it's a GOA or other market measures to, to get you all to, to do more production value on the continent? Because at the end of the day, it comes back to jobs and, and skills development and creation for no matter who, who you are, right? If we can't create a job, if we can't uh, build that skill set, we're all a little bit worse off for the world. And I know every time, you know, Jay invests in a production in the continent, you know, there's theaters back in the United States that are off takers, which has jobs created around it. And there's production facilities, there's marketing, there's a global audience. So where do we take today's conversation to the next level? How do we as a business community look towards this non-traditional field of the creative industries to really, you know, expand it to the next level? What What is it that the private sector can do to partner with you? Uh, I'll start with Linda, go to Jay and, and end with your excellency. Yeah, for us, when we speak to our partners at Maven Records for a long time, you know, governments on the continent didn't take the creative industry seriously. They thought it was, you know, play. Um, I think now governments are now, we're starting to get interest from even the Nigerian government in how to really help develop the skills that Jay was speaking to. Um, Maven has been an engine for job creation, especially in the last three, four years. It always was, but even now with this increased investment and the increased amount of revenue coming in, um, programs like Maven's Future Five are seeking to really partner and educate the next generation of creatives and professionals that surround the creative community. Um, so I think that's one piece. Um, critically, I believe it's just going to be listening, right? It's going to be listening to creatives like Don Jazzy and Tega in ways to create help create an enabling environment, including um, ways to make it easier to travel within Africa. Sometimes it's been one of our challenges. Um, our music is across the continent, but sometimes it is, you know, in terms of, you'll think about visas, you'll think about um, even inter-African inter travel. So I think those are some of the key things, but, you know, generally they think the government is really starting to understand the value that the creative industry has to offer as a partner. And we are excited to partner and work with the government. Excellent. Jay, I'll turn to you and then I'll come over to, to His Excellency after that. Sure. I, I think there's two things uh, that I want to emphasize. One is that we are a business, right? And I think traditionally people think bricks and mortar. And the reality is we are a, you can think of each production as its own bricks and mortar business, right? And we will spend anywhere from 10 to $100 million per season on a given show. And all the employment and all the infrastructure around that is what we need help with, right? So we need help with having those companies that are established. We need to know about them. We need to be able to get people in and out of the country. So Ed, I think the, the big key takeaway I want people to think about is it's not just the artists in front of the camera, as Linda said, it's the infrastructure around this. And this is big business now. We've turned into a multi-billion dollar worldwide business. And every single one of my productions, I have to decide where I'm gonna place that production in the world. 
And so when I have a good experience and there's, there is a history of good experiences across Africa that we want to continue partnering with everybody to develop that. So, and, and you know, it, it, a couple of analogies, it's like a sports team, right? Sports teams travel around, but we embrace the sports industry. And so we, we need that same kind of, of, of promotion and partnership that way. I think the other thing too, which is really, and I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to finish the morning without saying this is that, you know, a successful production becomes literally an advertisement for that part of the world. And we have a, a rich history, Lord of the Rings in New Zealand, Game of Thrones in Northern Ireland, even number one ladies detective in Botswana. You know, when we have a successful show raised by warriors right now and warrior, people wanna know where it was filmed, right? There's a buzz about especially local content produced films these days. So that's the kind of upside you have when we have a successful production, but it's about the business. It's about us coming there and being able to deal with people in a, in a, in a level playing field business environment. So anything that you would do for other sectors, think about that in terms of our sector, skills development, uh, stable incentive, stable infrastructure. So I think it's just important for people to think about us as a business, a billion dollar business, which can stimulate so many parts of the economy from an economic standpoint as get as well as get out to the world, the culture and who you are and literally becomes a great signpost for, for any country across the entire continent. You're exactly right. Tying the, the cultural elements to the actual dollars that are being spent has to be done in a more meaningful way for government so that those incentives are met for all industries under the, the creative. Uh, that's a, a, a wonderful way to end uh, as we move towards uh, your excellency from a UNESCO standpoint, similar variation. What can you all do to help support what Jay, Jay and Linda are doing in their markets respectively? Uh, I think a very in a, a few words. I mean, what's what's happening in Africa? I mean, first of all, the positive thing is that uh, there are more and more awareness from the governments of the importance of cultural industry into the development, and more investment are being public invest, investment are are going into the the into culture broadly speaking. Uh, but there is one thing that uh, we 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 should we can do. To help the, the creative industries and take it out of the informality. Too many uh, artists or producers are working in a, in a small corner and are fighting to get uh, uh, into the open space. And let's find a way to get all this creativity out of the the the, the, the small uh, uh, room or or a small space where they they are. They are. We need to, to uh, open Africa to the world. We need to get those informal, informal economy to a more formal and structured economy that can compete with the rest of the world. I think that's uh, the final uh, thought I want to share, to share with you. Excellent. Well, thank you, Excellency. I think that's exactly right. That big transition from informal to formal sectors is really the key to Africa's growth and potential and putting those dollars on paper that people then can plan around is going to be critical critical i do want to thank each of you i want to welcome you back uh for a future dialogue on this i think we can go much further and take more examples and bring in different sectors and support mechanisms i do think the u.s government needs to be more aware of the positive impact the creative industry is having on the u.s economy on a host of societal issues as well and i really uh implore you all to to continue continue the good fight i think it's an amazing sector that we need to really bring to the forefront the, so thank you again, and we'll make sure to bring the uh, consistency application back uh, for Jay and Linda to all the governments, as well as on the IP protection. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Scott. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you. Well, on behalf of the US Chamber of Commerce, I wanna thank all of today's distinguished uh, speakers, business leaders, uh, government uh, speakers. It's really been a fantastic conversation to kind of break away from our traditional a Goa conversation uh, about the market access to what is the future of the market. And I think that was uh, very well laid out today. I do want to thank uh, personally, Alessandra Walsh on the US Africa Business Center's team. She really is the glue to making sure events like today's come together smoothly, uh, as well as Nick uh, from our, our events team. Thank you both, as well as the rest of our, our friends and colleagues. I want to thank again, the Department of Commerce, uh, Minister Betty Mina and our friends across, uh, across many, many time zones. We're encouraged by the future of AGOA and the role that the digital economy will play, uh, creative industries. This is a really sign of opportunity. I 
really like what Jay said there at the end about we have to align the impact that this is having on our visual perception perceptions of of Africa as well as the economic one. When you think of hundreds of billions of dollars of investment over a a ten year lifespan of a of a movie industry, television production, you know, uh, music industry, it's really uh, an impact that is overlooked on many days. I want to remind you all that coming up uh, at the December sixth and seventh timeframe. We'll have a two-day digital economy summit focused on Africa. We'll bring in policy dialogues. We'll have a digital startup competition for all of our friends and family in West and Central Africa, something we did last year in Nigeria, where we provide a platform and a stepping stone for startups uh, so that are having a societal impact to make a bigger voice be had. But thank you again on behalf of the chamber and our collective family around the continent, around the world. We look forward to our next conversation with you. Thank you.